Oh, well, everybody. Is this the forward? Okay, so I wanted to first say that I think that the most important thing that this can be accomplished today is what was just accomplished. You know, what you guys did was you talked to each other during the break. And that is the most important thing. So whatever we say here isn't that important. Uh, and I want to prove that with an anecdote from a couple of years ago, which is that uh, Tanya Bergera and Teddy Cruz had both spoken in the same afternoon. And I was speaking to Teddy Cruz afterwards, and he said, you know, Tanya said something really interesting this morning, which was that it's time to restore Marcel Duchamp's urinal to the bathroom. And what she meant by that was that it's sort of OK to take an object, or it was OK to take an object out of circulation of life, put it on a pedestal, and that became art. But it's time now to put that urinal back into circulation, that artwork back into life, back into plumbing. So I heard this, and <clears throat> excuse me, I've been sort of hoping to work with Tanya anyway. So I said to Tanya, you know, I actually have a urinal just like that. And uh, it would be really great if you would restore that urinal to the bathroom at the Queen's Museum. So again, this came out of this, you know, side conversation. So she said, great, you know, I'm going to do this. Uh, you know, it's part of this idea of useful art. So we did. We took it to the bathroom and installed it. This is just when our mutt was about to be painted onto the urinal. Of course, it was painted on, and our, our uh, you know, maintenance guy cleared it off immediately the next morning. And that's one of the risks when you take art and reintegrate it into life is that people aren't going to see it as art. I mean, there were, our maintenance staff would never clean our mud off of a urinal if it was on a pedestal in the gallery. But <clears throat> we repainted it. It's there in the bathroom. It says our mud. I've used it many times. And the, <laughs> but the point is, in a way, this is a symbolic representation of the idea that symbolic representation isn't enough anymore and that we need to find use for art. But out of that also, and a whole bunch of other conversations that Nato and Anne were having with uh, Tanya, came the idea to do a project together with Tanya, Creative Time, Queens Museum, and it's called Immigrant Movement. This is an ongoing project, uh, co-sponsored um, the first year by Creative Time and us. Now we're you know, continuing for another couple of years. And what it is, is a project about immigration. It's an ongoing performance. It's a space. It's a place on Roosevelt Avenue where immigrants work together, uh, where a lot of the lessons of uh, sort of social activism are put into practice on a daily basis. So I want you guys can all come and visit Immigrant Movement. It's open all the time. And here are some of the things that um, have happened at Immigrant Movement. Uh, I think everybody knows that the DREAM Act you know, it's a real issue on the streets of Queens. 60% of heads of household in Queens are immigrants. If you take immigrants, children of immigrants, and American-born minorities, that's 90% of our community. So in this space have happened a whole bunch of uh, projects. This is a dreamers um, meeting. Uh, everybody in that room was a dreamer. You know, to, to understand even what this two-year hiatus, which is a completely unacceptable you know, compromise means for these kids is that you can go to college, you can, get a, you can get a scholarship. There are all kinds of things that are separate from working legally in the United States that are fundamental. Uh, in that room, there's uh, every Wednesday afternoon, uh, based on El Sistema, the Venezuelan idea of classical music uh, for everybody. Uh, people are learning how to play the violin. If you don't think that there is a liberatory effect of Western classical music available, uh, you should visit this Wednesday afternoon workshop and see these kids learning how to play violins. Um, I guess I have to point at the. This was a uh, workshop on useful art. Again, Creative Time and us work together. We have the city council member from our area, Julissa Ferreira, speaking. You can see Rick Lowe over here, Tanya Bergera in the back. It was an amazing discussion over a couple of days in that site, in that community site in Queens, about useful art. Um, Tanya wanted to write a manifesto, a bunch of intellectuals came around, uh, an immigrant manifesto. They came from all over the country. They worked with uh, some uh, workers from the community. It was a bilingual Spanish-English moment. And from that, Tanya and five other people performed the immigrant manifesto at the United Nations in five languages, the five languages of the UN. 
again, a creative time, Queen's Museum co-production. So again, I'm saying that all this happened because of a side conversation uh, at the Creative Time Summit. And you guys, you know, you should get together after this is over, whatever we have to say, and try to, you know, imagine something like this. And, you know, I know what you're saying, thinking to yourself that we have a, you know, vast unfair advantage, which is that we're in Queens. But you know something? <laughs> There's this uh, vehicle for cultural translation available to you. It's called the seven train. You guys should get on the seven train and come to Queens. Aha. We got some Queens people in the audience. Thank you. Um, another, uh, again, another project we did together. We went to Occupy Wall Street. There was a day in which the uh, Tanya gave a speech. We marched from uh, Foley Square down to Zuccotti Park on that afternoon. So. Another thing that brings us here today, of course, and, and this is what the prize is about, is this idea of art and social change. And one of the things that kind of drives me crazy when people talk about art and social change is they don't really talk about social change. They don't talk about social, how change, social change occurs. I'm actually very heartened to see today, you know, we we're talking about what happened this morning was that there's a lot of real social change types who were art world types or, or sort of on the border of the art world or maybe not even in the art world at all. And that's, that's really great. But I think that, you know, I've just, uh, as Anne said, finished writing a book about uh, socially cooperative art. And you have to look back to social change movements in the United States to look for roots. And I put this slide up. There, there's a wonderful article uh, by a guy named Paul Starr called The Phantom Community. And he talks about different kinds of social organizations within the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement in the United States. And, he, you know, it's a very broad brush, but he talks about the exemplary versus the adversarial institutions. And in a way, the exemplary would be, you know, be the change you want in, in the world, kind of uh, Gandhian idea that Martin Luther King followed, versus the adversarial would be more um, exemplified by Malcolm X by any means necessary. Um, but I think that this kind of plays out today in the way that we think about uh, activist art. We have kind of the, the two wings, and I'll get to sort of my feelings about that in a minute. But uh, one of the things also talked about by Starr is uh, the idea that Students for a Democratic Society, for example, was clearly both an adversarial uh, and an exemplary institution. It was hyper-democratic. In fact, some people say it sort of fell apart because of its hyper-democracy in the long run. But uh, this is the, you know, the founding statement of SDS written uh, at the University of Michigan, Port Huron statement. Um, the other uh, person that I think is, is crucial in this whole thing, or maybe not him, but what he exemplifies, Saul Alinsky, the sort of uh, person who talks most eloquently about community organizing. He's not the father of community organizing. That was happening already. But he wrote Reveille for Radicals and Rules for Radicals, which everybody should walk straight out of here and go get. I'll tell you why in a minute. But uh, so mixing this in, I'll get to art in a minute, I promise. Uh, you know, aside from the civil rights movement, the sort of the anti-war movement, the community organizing. And by the way, I don't have sort of the time to make this into a, uh, a chronological statement today, so I'm kind of mixing everything together. But obviously, feminism was extremely important. And if you took, uh, this is a Red Stockings meeting, but there was a one moment in a, a early consciousness raising session at New York Radical Women. Uh, which was a group that, that did a lot of that uh, consciousness raising early on. And a woman named Carol Hanish, they were talking about the Miss America pageant. And Carol Hanish said, you know, why don't we actually do something active about this? And she said, let's do a, what she called a, sn a zap action based on the ideas that Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, had done. And so what the New York Radical Women did was they went to Atlantic City and they did a street performance. So you, you take feminism, you add SNCC, and you get the action on the boardwalk and at the Miss America pageant in Atlantic City. I'm really simplifying. I hope I'm not offending anybody by the incredible simplifications. Um, but this is the, the thing. So that street theater uh, was sort of this addition of uh, social activism and art ideas. At the same time, there were feminist artists like Merle Eucles, who were uh, translating feminism into a kind of a new kind of socially cooperative, socially activist, socially interactive art. Uh, and she then 
uh, combined her sort of feminist performances with a kind of public uh, interactive performance that became her sanitation project, which is still going on today. Um, another strand of discussion in, in the book, which I'm interested in pursuing, is uh, the Diggers came out of the San Francisco Mine Group. The Diggers, thank you, we have a Diggers fan here. Um, the Diggers were in, in and I, I, there was this beautiful quote in a film about the Diggers, which is that they, that they wanted to live as if the revolution had already been won. Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin, who were part of that group, moved to New York City and wanted to form the New York City Diggers. And when they were, they were rejected by the Diggers to use their, uh, their name. And they said, no, no, you're too directly politically activist. This is an action that they did uh, where they dropped money on the stock exchange. All the people ran for the money, exposed the sort of uh, mentality of the people at the, on the floor. They burned money afterwards. So again, actually, these guys thought they were artists and they were actually very uh, upset that they never got show at MoMA, et cetera. Um, I think a direct descendant of that kind of uh, street action uh, was ACT UP and, and what they did on the streets of New York City in relationship to AIDS. Uh, the sort of more liberal, more, let's say, conciliatory side of that might have been the AIDS ribbon. Um, so another strand. If you start with Fluxus, this is a Fluxus performance by Yoko Ono. Yoko, uh, in this cut piece, would sit on the stage and the audience would come up and cut her clothes off piece by piece. Apparently got quite tense and violent at certain points when this performance w occurred. Um, a, a Fluxus, uh, let's say a son of Fluxus, was Alan Capro. Alan Capro, by the time this performance or this happening happened, there was no audience. Everybody was a participant. Uh, Capro went out to the West Coast. Capro became the professor of incredible artists like Suzanne Lacey, who's over here. Can we have a hand for Suzanne Lacey one more time? Uh, <laughs> Suzanne Lacey and students like that, I'm sure she can tell this story much better than I can, uh, infused feminism and, and sort of the urgency of feminism and direct political action into the Capro aesthetic, which was much more sort of internal to the art world and ended up with performances like this, where, where older women were sitting around tables telling stories about aging, et cetera. The audience uh, moved from uh, the, the area above down to listen to them, and this de developed into performances like this, in which uh, these folks are sitting uh, talking about issues of violence, et cetera, uh, in cars on the top of a uh, parking garage in Oakland. Oakland, right? Yes, OK. God, it's so intimidating to have the artist sitting right there. Um, <laughs> So I'm just trying to show these kind of uh, a couple of different strands. Another uh, son of Fluxus was Joseph Boyce, who went away to Europe and who came back. This is his first lecture in the United States uh, at, when he came back. Uh, and he became incredibly influential on young artists, including a guy named Rick Lowe, who was at the time he began reading Joseph Boyce, working at a place called Shape Community Center, self 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 help for African people through education. It's a place in Houston. It's very active. It's still there. Um, and Rick put Joseph Boyce's idea of you, you know, everybody could be an artist together with shape and started Project Row Houses, uh, which is, I don't have to describe it. I think everybody in this room, if you don't know what it is, uh, please look it up. I don't have time to describe it. Um, the other side of that coin, I would say, in terms of uh, the antagonistic versus the um, cooperative art would be something like Santiago Sierra. And I was you know, sort of set to say that I, in some way, favors this, favor this representation or this creation of a situation for the black uh, uh, identity or the black body than this. But then I was reminded of a scene. Uh, so again, it's the adversarial versus the cooperative or the adversarial um, versus the exemplary. I was remembering uh, or the antagonism versus cooperation, rupture versus healing. Um, in Life of Brian, uh, there's a scene. <clears throat> Brian uh, was born next to Jesus, grew up, became quite politicized because of the oppressive nature of his environment. And at a certain point, he joins the People's Front for the Liberation of Judea. This is him meeting the People's Front. That's almost the entire People's Front right there. And uh, you know, they're very contentious relationship with the other liberation organizations in, in uh, Judea at the time. 
So they all uh, they uh, hatch a plot, <clears throat> and they're going in to uh, kidnap Pilate's wife. This is a kind of comedy situation that's quite common. Is they show up at the same time as another group, and the other group is the campaign for free Galilee. And they're in there, and they're getting ready to, you know, and so they get into this huge fight, and Brian shouts out, but surely we should be fighting together against our common enemy. And they say, you mean the Judean people's front? And he says, no, the Romans. So this moment in this movie, you know, was one of these sort of conversion experiences for me to say that, again, we shouldn't be fighting between Rick Lowe and Santiago Sierra, between the exemplary and the um, antagonistic, that we should be fighting against the Romans. But I guess what was interesting uh, to me today in relationship to the uh, boycott of this by some artists, and especially in relationship to the fact that this is a, a bunch of Jewish activists trying to get the Romans out of their home, which is Palestine, um, was this question of, uh, um, you know, what, what is the relationship as an activist to a situation like this? And I feel like in some ways, I wanted to say, um, uh, so I want to say sort of two things simultaneously. One is that I kind of admire anybody who would have the guts to cancel something at the last moment like that, that that's really gutsy and it's bad for their career. And I say to them, congratulations to have that kind of moral fiber. On the other hand, I have to say, if you are going to boycott the Creative Time Summit, I don't quite know what you can go to. You know, and we're all in this room today. And uh, <clears throat> there are terrible things going on in terms of sponsorship every single place you go. And you have to figure out what, how to be effective within that. So this is, uh, I'm a pragmatist. I follow John Dewey. And John Dewey, this is from uh, <clears throat> Pedro Reyes' installation at Documenta. And he said, we should not be asking, is this the way things are? But rather, what are the practical implications of adopting this perspective? So I think that the practical implications of, you know, that's what we have to be thinking about as uh, activists, as artists. And one of the things that I think we have to be thinking about is who knows how to get things done when it comes to social action. And I think you guys uh, in the audience, I urge you <clears throat> to break out of thinking about only what it is that artists have been thinking about and look to people like community organizers who create social actions that are effective. And there are tools to do that and we've had folks at the Queens Museum go off and get community organizing training because those are the people that actually know how to do this stuff. So don't just read Zizek. Please do read Zizek. But don't just read Zizek. Read him and read Saul Linsky the next day and then back to theory and back to practice. Not that you're only theory. <laughs> don't mean to say that. OK. So then the third reason we're here, aside from to talk about the fact that we are part of a community that has a history, aside from the fact that you, know, you guys should be thinking about what to do after you get out of this boring lecture and into a communication with, between yourselves, is to honor Fernando Garcia Dori. And I was on the panel that selected him. I have to say, it was just an incredible uh, eye-opening experience. We had, to, we had every artist we could have imagined. We had incredible artists to choose from. Everybody loved his work. I want to say that if you're looking at that perspective, this is from his website. So if you're looking at that sort of exemplary versus say, adversarial, I'd say he's on the exemplary side. And if there's one art project uh, that I haven't seen that I could have been at, uh, this is it. And I, I hope Fernando will talk about it later. This is the uh, time when he brought nomadic people together. These are people, you know, public art, social art, political art tends to be very urban. This is a guy who has really looked at the, how those ideas could be uh, played out in, in the rural. And I think it's extremely important. So it's really a great honor today to be one of the nominators, I, I see it feels like at the convention here, um, for such an incredible artist. So I actually have 35 seconds left, but that's it. I'm going to end early. Thank you very much. Thank you.